month's webinar. We are delighted that many of you have decided to take time on our Friday lunch hour in California or wherever else you might be to join us. So before we get rolling, a few uh, bookkeeping items. Um, the presentation will begin shortly, go until approximately 1 p.m. Um, that's California time. Uh, Sri Ram has consented to stay on for a bit uh, after 1 o'clock in the event that there are additional questions or a discussion that you'd like to have. The slides and the recordings will be available at the end of this presentation. Log into your account to view them. Uh, please keep your telephone or microphone muted at all times. Only unmute yourself if you need to ask questions. If you find that you've been muted uh, throughout the event, it might be because uh, you know I'm uh, getting uh, audio feedback as I unmute you, in which case uh, the way to ask questions is via chat. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, you can also uh, send in questions via chat, and I'll relay them to Sri Ram. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, today, we're delighted to have Sri Ram Rao to talk with us about resource management infrastructure for scale-out analytics platform. Uh, Sri Ram manages the Cloud and Information Services Lab at Microsoft. It's an applied research group that comprises of two teams, systems and data sciences. And over the past couple of years, uh, his work has focused on problems related to cluster resource management. His research work has been published in top systems conferences. And prior to Microsoft, uh, Sriram led the design and implementation of KFS, the Cosmos file system, which has been deployed at Quantcast since 2008, and he used to manage petabytes of data. It's become the default file system at uh, Quantcast for all of their data, as well as MapReduce jobs. Uh, also, while at Quantcast, Sriram led the design and implementation of Sailfish, a framework for handling intermediate data at scale. Both KFS and Sailfish have been released as open source projects. Uh, Sriram obtained his BS, MS, and PhD in computer sciences from University of Texas at Austin. With that, uh, Sriram, take it away. Hello, Sriram. Hello. Sriram, can you hear me? Hello, Sriram, can you hear me? Folks, give me a second. Uh, it looks like Sriram is not able to hear me, so I'm just going to uh, text him, so I apologize for the delay. Um, hello, Sriram? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Hey, I was just texting you, so uh, sorry, folks, for the confusion. It looks like we have Sriram back online. So, Sriram, go ahead and uh, get rolling. Okay. Thanks, Sridhar. Th th thanks for setting this up. Uh, what I will do today is describe a bit about, you know, what we have, uh, what we are doing in my group here at Microsoft. Um, the focus is mostly on big data and, you know, building a platform for handling the big data. See if I can. Okay, so a bit, bit about myself and my group. My group is called Sizzle. It stands for Cloud and Information Services Lab. This was started back in May 2012. Um, our focus, I mean, at Microsoft, you know, is more about an applied research group where we have broken down into two teams. Um, I manage the system side of the the group. There is another group we have which focuses on machine learning and applying machine learning for the big data systems. Um, as a group, you know, our focus is mostly from, uh, because we are a very an applied research group, our focus varies from, you know, doing a bit of innovative work, namely building prototypes, trying out some new ideas. Whatever seems promising, we take to the next step. Uh, we actually build an actual system. Uh, because it's innovative work, we end up publishing papers in top conferences, as well as uh, we write code that, you know, with the intent of running it in production. Uh, so far, our mindset has been on contributing code back to open source, namely the, the Hadoop code base. I will talk about that. Uh, several folks in my team have uh, Hadoop committer privileges. Now, a lot of the systems that we build um, also, 
who were, you know, are you are deployed at Microsoft, and they are uh, in many ways, you know, we work very closely with the big data teams at Microsoft. This includes both the Hadoop team as well as the the, the Bing Cosmos uh, folks. When we, the, our vision as a group when we started was to build a single cluster for uh, doing scale out analytics. The vision has pretty much been the same except that the scale that we had in mind went up by an order of magnitude. Um, I'll cover how we addressed that as part of this work. The go, I mean, as we once you when whenever we talk about building a scale out platform for doing analytics, the kind of workload that we want to run varies anywhere from bad jobs that run for hours to interactive queries which you know need to complete on the order of seconds to long running services which you know once you run a bad job you produce some output we sort of want to have services which uh, which look at slivers of the data and use it for uh, serving purposes so our uh, our work sort of we want to span this sort of a mix again whenever you talk about building a one large cluster um, the cluster is going one of the things a cluster operator has to do is to focus on maximizing the return on investment. You know, these cluster costs at tens of millions of dollars to buy, to build and operate. And therefore, you one way to increase the ROI is simply to take all of your workload and put it on the same one. Um, so the workload will run a mix of production jobs that have SLAs, meaning many of these website operators they they, they run jobs over the the previous day's data. They generate analytic reports, which uh, you know need to be handed to their partners by a certain amount of time. If the data is not handed to the partners, this uh, per the time, which is the which is the SLA, there will be financial penalties. This is this is fairly common in this space, and so we do need to run. You know, we do the system does need to be aware of jobs that have these sorts of requirements. The again, in the, the theme of maximizing return on investment means that we will need to maximize the cluster cluster job throughput. Uh, when we started, our goal was mostly on the order of you know a few thousand machines. Um, over the last couple of years, we've kind of increased the scale to tens of thousands of machines. And whenever you have this one single cluster providing a single system image, if you will, the issues turn into we want the system to be always available. Meaning, you know, you can take parts of the system down, but the overall system has to provide the ability of being always on. The software should be backwards and forwards compatible. We need to support rolling upgrades. And then the system should automatically reconfigure itself when components fail. I mean, at this scale, on the tens of thousands of machines, having you know having individuals trying to fix up things when components fail is simply not possible. So, Sriram, there's a question here. Sure. Go ahead, please. Uh, 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 sh uh, sh shall you ask the question now, or do you want us to wait? Sure, that's fine. Go ahead with the question. If I need to defer, I will defer. So the question has to do with, uh, is in terms of building a distributed system that supports large numbers of nodes, is there a fundamental difference between supporting analytics workloads versus general purpose distributed computing workloads, let's say like a mail system, for example? Ah, so the differences are, uh, okay, good question. Let me, let, me, let me see if I can try to give you a flavor for this one. See, some of these, uh, in terms of a general purpose, you know, analytics platform, the kinds of workloads are going to be diverse. You know, like I point out on this slide, you're going to have bad jobs which will process tens of terabytes of data, run for hours, uh, and then you will also have jobs which will be, you know, which basically look at uh, effectively uh, process gigabytes of data, and you're looking at uh, individual key value pairs. This is where the services or interactive queries come. In. This is sort of the characteristic of uh, big data workloads. Now, on the other hand, when you look at standard distributed computing sort of models, like a mail server, I mean, it handles only one kind of an application. You know, you, which primarily read only, primarily, uh, you know, most people are reading mail, and these are mostly all uh, small point access of the, you know, sort of pointy access to data, which is where the fundamental difference between the two systems is. Ah, okay. Thank you. And folks, uh, if you have asked a question and I have um, watched it or you have a follow-on, please either send me the follow-on or indicate that uh, unmute yourself and follow on directly with Sriram. Thanks, Sriram. Okay, I'll keep going. So in terms of, you know, given this sort of vision, what we have done as a group and uh, has been to basically take the, uh, you know, Hadoop yarn. I will uh, talk a bit about what that is. Um, you know, this is effectively Hadoop 2.0 and try to focus on uh, three sets of problems 
to that have, that we think were we thought were important to addressing the vision. So the first problem, uh, you know, systems like uh, the big data platform like Hadoop has is there is no way to provide uh, to distinguish jobs that are important and jobs that are urgent. I mean, it treats all the jobs the same, and and so effectively it becomes very hard to run uh, jobs with completion SLAs along with other competing best effort jobs. I mean, I'll, I'll get into details about that. A system we have built to address this particular problem is called Rayon. Uh, it does, I mean, effectively it does reservation-based scheduling. Uh, Rayon has been contributed to contributed back to Hadoop. It ships with the Hadoop 2.6, you know, the latest version. The second bit that we've done is uh, because you want to run jobs, you know, big and small, and small jobs have uh, allocation issues. Uh, we've, we've built a, fr a framework called Mercury again by extending Yarn. I'll talk about this one. Uh, this sort of combines the best of you know centralized and distributed scheduling to allow applications to get, you know to tune their uh, to tune their latencies. Uh, this is in work in progress and will be contributed back to the Hadoop code base in the coming months. The last bit, uh, this is you know work that is very much in progress, is the effectively trying to reach the scalability goal. Uh, the you know Hadoop Yarn is known to scale to about 4,000 machines. Uh, the, our work has been to you know how do we get to 50, uh, tens of thousands of machines, and so we've taken this idea of federation. I'll talk about this one as well. I mean this is work in progress. This will probably again be contributed back to Hadoop over the next year. So with this as the context. Uh, just to make sure everybody is on the same page, I have included a few slides about uh, Hadoop Yarn. Uh, this is uh, from a talk that was uh, given at uh, uh, you know at the symposium on cloud computing a couple of years ago by many of the Hadoop folks. Um, the Apache Hadoop, as it stands, has effectively you know three core components. One is the distributed file system; it's called HDFS. The second bit is a computation engine for doing MapReduce. This is basically many of the ideas are based on the original MapReduce paper from Google. And the third, and the third bit, which is the the new thing they have added called you know yet another resource negotiator or YARN. I'll tell you a bit about that. The so think of YARN as sort of the 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 operating system, if you will, for the entire cluster, and then. It just give it, it provides a, it provides an API to build applications on top of it, and using that API, you know, there's been a bunch of applications such as you know, Pig, Hive, uh, for query processing. Hive is from Facebook. Giraffe is for graph processing from LinkedIn. Uh, Spark is for stream processing from uh, you know, for, for interactive querying from Berkeley. Storm is stream processing. HBase is for doing a key value store and and so on and so forth. It's been a rich ecosystem around this project. So just to give you some background, when the Hadoop has its roots mainly from you know doing uh, big data, big here meaning in the order of uh, mainly for web crawl, where it was designed for batch execution, and it started with in, in the with the goal of building effectively an annotated web graph. You collect a bunch of crawl data, try and do you know effectively compute page rank. I mean they were doing all of the work to help make that happen, and what has happened since? They pretty much everybody realized that it, the the framework provided a nice way to sort of uh, you know do parallel programming on a, a scale, and as a result, uh, you know it's sort of become used for everything else. You know, focus on interactive execution, streaming, small, large, etc. And again, as more background, the previous model was focused on one application and one application only, and the one application was MapReduce. The, uh, the system consisted of a central brain that that is called as the job tracker. I mean, it, th this was the one that effectively was uh, handling all the jobs in the cluster. Every computation was expressed as a MapReduce computation. Then, on every individual machine, um, there was a component that was run that's called the task tracker, and this was one that was responsible for spinning up tasks. The tasks were of two flavors: either a map or a reduce. And in order for the computations to make progress. Uh, what the Hadoop team had decided was to split the you know the slots in the cluster, if you will, and so a slot here stands for some bun, you know a, a bundle of CPU and memory, and what is shown on this slide are three hosts, each with four map slots and two reduce slots, and so once you submit a once you submit a job, the job tracker you know picks up these jobs and then it decides first to schedule maps and then it will schedule the reduce tasks, 
And so in this picture, you know, the, the sort of the, 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 the pink color shows the one where job J0 is running reduced tasks and the orange one shows a task where there are, uh, you know, where it's running map and reduce slots. Now when the client, so in this model the client submits a job, a new job gets accounted and once this new job comes in, the, 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 the new job then has to also, you know, be expressed as a map reduce computation. So, you know, some map slots will get started. Let me get the animation going. So there are periodic heartbeats from, from these, uh, from individual nodes to say their existence. And then the job tracker will schedule the map slot. And then, you know, a few more map slots come in, the computation progresses, and then, you know, the reduce slots get scheduled, and then the computation finishes. The problems with this model were pretty apparent. One was that the, effectively the job tracker was doing too much work. Not only was it trying to schedule jobs, you know, schedule tasks for different jobs, it also was responsible for deciding when to run what where. It was effectively doing too much work, it was not scalable, and there was also fate sharing. If the job tracker failed, that meant that all the jobs that were running at that time, you know, they effectively had failed and they had to be restarted. And trying to add the, uh, since fault tolerance or HA was something that was taught about five years after the system was deployed, it was effectively impossible to add uh, uh, to, to add you know HA to the job tracker, and this worked pretty much fine because the cluster sizes was you know were about four thousand in size, and and they had people who knew and how to operate operate this. But as the system became more popular and you know other applications wanted to be run on top, it became very difficult to scale as well as get higher utilization because the slots were either map or reduced. And so recognizing all these problems. The Hadoop community decided to effectively rewrite the rewrite the stack, and they split that into two two layers. The higher level layer, the lower level layer, is basically the platform. They, they introduced something called a resource manager. The resource manager focused more on effectively just allocating slots. You know, this bundle of CPU, memory, and so forth. Um, it, it provided ability to do locality aware scheduling, fault tolerance, and so forth. Whereas the, the, on the other side, the uh, the application master or the framework effectively ran the um, uh, ran the computation. I mean, the, any job that played nice with the APIs exposed by the resource manager uh, made it uh, you know effectively made it possible to run arbitrary jobs in the system. So you could use the same framework to run a MapReduce job. You could use the same framework to run a Hive query, run a Spark a Spark job, and so forth. And so pictorially it's the same same system as before. You now have a single resource manager and each node manager exposes slots. So just so think resource manager is equivalent to the job tracker from 1.0 land and think node manager is equivalent to task tracker from 1.0 land. The only difference is the node manager simply takes takes a command line and spins up a process to start it. The resource manager decides who should get a slot where. So in this picture, when the, so when the client submits a job, uh, it asks the resource manager for uh, to, to 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 start this job, and the resource manager picks up one of the node managers. You know, creates a uh, uh, creates a component there. That component is called the application master. This application master is then responsible for orchestrating the computation. So the application master talks to the uh, resource manager, gets containers, or on on these various machines. You know, decides when to submit tasks to those machines and what to run there. That's all application logic left to the application master. And what this animation also shows is when you when the second client comes in, it, it, the same thing happens. You know, it, it, it spins the, the resource manager spins up an application master on node on node manager on host two. The node man the, the application master then uh, interfaces with the RM, uh, you know, gets containers on host one. You know, it spins up two uh, two containers there, C0 and C1, and runs whatever uh, computation it wants. Okay. Is, uh, a question? Yes. Um, does the resource manager have to be, um, uh, I guess when you define a task, is there some notion of uh, the resources it needs in terms of time, et cetera, so that uh, the resource manager can actually do an intelligent job in terms of scheduling? So the main thing that, that uh, each application master does, the way the, the resource negotiation protocol is defined is that the application master comes up and it says, 
you know, I want a container who, with which which uh, with a certain with a, of a certain characteristic. Meaning, I want a container which has two cores, uh, you know, say a six gigabyte of RAM. And if you can give me give them to me on either host ten, host fifteen, host thirty, if 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 that that's my first preference. And if failing that, you know, give me anywhere else. I mean, that's the that's the language of resource negotiation. So you specify constraints to the resource manager. And the resource manager just does matchmaking based on whatever resources are available. And and in in this system, the model is sort of once you get the contain, once you get the resource, is yours until you relinquish it. I mean, there's a, so effectively what happens is the the resource manager gives a container to the application master. The application master tells the node manager to start something there. And as long as the the, the process is running, the the container is yours. And once the process exits, the resources get reclaimed. Does that answer the question? Uh, well, I'll let the person asking follow up. But uh, I had one follow up, I guess. Uh, how did the, in terms of the language of resource negotiation, you said, uh, you know, to use your example, that uh, you may say, give me something on host 10, host 15, and host 18. How does the task know that those are the three hosts that are preferred? Ah, so there's a couple of ways to do so that that is more again application level logic. So that the, the a typical way that's done is uh, many of the computations that run use data in the underlying distributed file system, namely the HDFS file system. So the HDFS file system has uh, uh, locality information which says given a particular file, where are the replicas of that file stored? And so the the, the the application master can query the the underlying file system, work out where the data is stored, and then turn around to the to, to the resource manager and say, "Oh, I I need containers on these three places." Got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let me keep going. So, uh, given all of this background about Yarn, uh, what we have done is effectively the three pieces I, I, I told you about. Uh, one is um, one is the rayon system which I'm going to tell you first. Then I'll talk about how we do uh, extending yarn to support you know this low latency allocation and then we'll talk about federation. Um, I'm going to use the term you know yarn plus plus to mean extensions to our extensions to yarn. Okay. So Rayon is a project that's a joint work with a bunch of folks. Uh, the specific, uh, the way contributions to Hadoop work is you file what's called you you file a feature request to their bug tracking system. It's called Jira, and in this case, our Jira number is uh, Yarn 1051, and uh, you know this has all of the this captures all the discussions that happened on this particular issue between us and other uh, uh, members of the Hadoop community. Uh, we also published a paper about this work at the Symposium on Cloud Computing last year. So again, the back background. Uh, so production jobs for ETL workloads typically have uh, some of these characteristics. This is fairly common at various uh, uh, various you know companies that do big data processing, if you will. Uh, pretty much, they collect uh, logs from you know, wherever in the around the world. The logs get uploaded to a central place, let's say by 6, 6 p.m. PST. They run an ETL job whose output needs to be ready by 2 a.m. PST. And they also tell, say that, look, this job is going to run for six hours. So if you do the math between six and then six hours of computation, effectively it will be done by around midnight. And they add in a couple of hours slack in case you know some things fail, the computations take, there's more data, it takes longer than needed. So they, there's some built-in uh, slack, if you will. If you were to look at it from an opposite point of view, given these characteristics, ideally the job should start the latest by 8 p.m. This is this is what we call as the allocation SLO. So if we provide, if we can meet the allocation SLO, the job will meet its completion time SLA. That's that's the that's the vocabulary I will use throughout this presentation. And effectively, if, if we given this is an ETL job, this has a this has a deadline. And 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 that's certain you know and this and it's important. The job needs to get its uh, com uh, you know computational bundles. In this case, one to you know 200 slots of one 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 CPU core and four gigabytes of RAM, independent of other uh, jobs in the system during this time period. And if you look at what are the options today, the options you had before uh, you know before we did Rayon, so to speak, was was twofold. 
and this was adoption one was has been done at various companies, you know, namely Yahoo and LinkedIn and so forth, where they had two clusters, one for running ad hoc or best effort jobs and another one for running production jobs. And in, and in these production jobs, they, they, they were doing manual admission control where somebody would submit a job, they would work out, if I submit this job and I have few other jobs that are already in the, in the place, Will this job go interfere with anybody else? If it is, they will not. Have, so there's always there was a human resource negotiation angle that was involved. It was expensive and was not sustainable, and is not sustainable. And the other approach is effectively, you know, what we call hope and pray. You you throw both of them into the same mix. The cluster scheduler can't tell the difference between what is important and what is urgent. The best effort jobs are important because that that incentivizes people to you know gives people the impression that the cluster is very responsive. You know, you end users think that the system is very is responsive. They are motivated to to get work done, but at the same time there are these jobs with SLAs which are urgent. And so since the system does not know the difference, and and the typical way this is handled in these cases is you know operators mess with job priorities. That's also very cumbersome and is also unmanageable at scale. And to address these problems, what we did was to introduce the notion of time to the cluster scheduler. So what, what it shows in the picture is, uh, if you think of the ARN as a resource manager or the, which has a scheduler which allocates uh, containers or resources to different uh, competing jobs, uh, we built a layer that sits above the scheduler. So if you have a production job or a job with SLA, you submit it through the Rayon system. Rayon does admission control, reserves resources and will uh, plan the cluster's agenda so that the production job will get its SLAs and then all of the ad hoc jobs or you know, best effort jobs are su submitted directly to the scheduler. The scheduler will backfill with ad hoc jobs and thereby maximize utilization. This is the, this is the mindset that you will see through the, the, this part of the presentation. So, a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, does Rayon actually also handle task dependencies? Uh, task dependencies again are an application level logic and that's all handled within the application master. So okay. the, when the AM comes in it will it has to decide how to you know how to how to layer the job if you will given that resources have been will be give, will be allocated to the job when it wants them. Okay. Uh, second question um, <clears throat> When you say it introduces the notion of time, does the uh, does the notion of time is a reservation by the by the by the application that says I need I need this at this time, or am I reserving for a time duration? Um, you are. I think it's the sec. I believe based on your description is the second one, but but you will see that when I show when I show you that one in a, in a minute. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of teaching the resource management about time, the the picture on the left shows what happens today. You know, best ever jobs and production jobs are submitted to the scheduler, and the scheduler just you know, mixes them in whatever way it sees fit. The picture on the right shows reservation-based scheduling, or, or basically our ideas. So best ever jobs go to the scheduler directly. The production jobs go to the reservation layer, and then the reservation layer does the planning. Meaning, if you you, you can basically explain to the system something like. I, I need uh, you know 200 cores uh, uh, and for four four uh, with four gigabytes of memory apiece for uh, for a, for a four hour window starting from two to six. I mean starting from for a four let's say two hour window starting from two to six, and then and then you will submit the and then the job will get submitted let's say by two. Now the system can decide when in this four hour window to give to to make you the promise of giving you the two hours of uh, computation time you need. So in the, in this in this example, when when you submitted the job say we're between two and you know between, and, and with the with the with the, with the time window of two to six, and you wanted two hour capacity, the system can offer you the capacity. Let's say starting at two, starting at three, starting at four, but no later than four. That's that's really the the, the mindset of the planning layer. So, so the, question? yep. Um, first question: How does Rayon take care of differentiating production jobs from best effort jobs? Okay, the, that is up to the user. The user decides if they want if they want their job to go through the production, you know, if they want to go through the rayon layer or they want, you know, they want to they want sort of get best effort preference. Presumably, that can be handled by some economic model in a production system where people yes. have to pay more for for uh, reservation yes. versus the that too. Yes. The second question is, how does it know how long a job will take? 
um, oh, if at so all, takes okay. more time to preempt it. Okay, so there are, so there are a couple of uh, knobs that I will talk about. So for best effort jobs, we backfill and then we use preemption to reclaim resources whenever the production job comes in and wants the resources it reserved. Now, as far as pre 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 predicting uh, how or how much uh, resources a production job will need or a, a task in a production job will need, there is also you know you can use past history to work out uh, your resource needs. I'll, I'll I'll touch upon that one in this presentation as well. Okay, let me keep going. So effectively there are three key ideas. One is there is a way to declaratively negotiate the resources and then um, we, so there is you know, one, one bit of all of the resource uh, negotiation and planning is that once you declaratively tell the system when you want it and how much, then this gives the system enough uh, flexibility in sort of you know, packing the system. If you, if you imagine that the cluster resources are sort of you know, are a bunch of the, uh, these jobs are effectively Tetris blocks that you need to sort of pack in a given space. That's that's effectively what we do. And the other bit that we also, the system also does, some pieces are implemented, some pieces are not, uh, are, you know, you can have situations where uh, there's a plan that's done, there's promises that are made, and then you realize that, you know, there was a cluster event where half the nodes in the cluster disappeared because of a power outage. I mean, whenever those sorts of uh, uh, catastrophic events happen I mean you have to decide uh, which jobs you know which jobs allocation SLOs you're going to fit I mean and that, so that's one then the other bit that also happens is some jobs make a you know they have some idea of how long their computation will last and they make their reservations accordingly now if the data changes or the failures if something happened then the computation will take longer than was previously planned so you will need to renegotiate so the system has hooks for uh, these two so in a, in a bit more detail, so what we have done in terms of resource based, reservation based scheduling is we introduced the concept of time uh, to the system. So the way we introduce the time to the system is the application, so uh, loosely speaking, the, you know, I'll, I'll talk through these seven, uh, seven stages if you will. So the first step, the application formulates a resource reservation request. You know, we have defined. Uh, we, have, we have a very simple language for specifying how how much capacity a given job wants and when it wants, and you know, and so forth. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide. So once given a, a particular uh, resource reservation request, that's then placed in the plan. So the, this is the picture which shows the planning agent. So the, so once it's placed in the plan, this allocation is then sort of validated against previously made promises. So the, we can accept a new job only if the new, the incoming job does not cause the allocation SLOs to previously uh, admitted jobs to, to be violated. So if we, if we detect that there's a violation possible, we don't admit the, the we, we reject the request. Then once this is uh, once this is done, the system then effectively commits to delivering the resources, and so the production job when it's submitted knows that it it, it will get its resources when it wants. So and then you know and the, and the and sort of the box in the middle uh, effectively we try to pack the, so the planning agent or the plan is tightly packed to maximize resources you know think of it in terms of a bin packing. Now once we have a plan, what the the runtime simply does is follows the plan that was generated offline, and and the way this is done in in terms of the Jan's uh, scheduling model is that uh, every it, there's. Uh, the YARN resource manager is a scheduler called a capacity scheduler. So the capacity scheduler, what it does is it promises capacities uh, to, to, to tenants or users and the way this is implemented is through queues. Each queue has a certain capacity and so jobs are submitted to queues and uh, jobs are rather bound to queues and the resources allocated to a job depend on the queues capacity. And then what we have implemented in Rayon is leveraged that model to sort of dynamically create and destroy queues. Uh, we, you know, introducing the notion of time for uh, uh, for, for these uh, production jobs, and effectively, job you know, the sixth step, the job when the job is submitted and when it's running, it gets its reserved resources, and then we adapt to live conditions such as failures and jobs running longer and so forth. So, with this is the background. Um, the language for specifying resource uh, reservation request is a, is what we call an RDL or resource uh, definition language. 
the SOCC paper has a lot more details about the various uh, flavors of the RDL. You know, we came up with this one by uh, effectively looking at the kinds of jobs that were run in clusters. Uh, loosely speaking, some of the requirements are effectively rectangles, which specify, you know, I, I want this much capacity for, for this much width and this much degree of parallelism for this time duration. And then the other thing that people also do is they basically say either they want sort of a you know massive amount of allocation for a short period of time, which is a, you know what we call as a tall and skinny, or you know short and wide, meaning you know we they they they're also interested in you know getting few a uh, few slots, but the, the 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 duration for which they need the capacity is far longer, and. That, that uh, and then that's effectively what these expressions say. Well, you know, the one on the example in B says, "Here is my time window for start with a start and a finish, and here is the order in which I want them, and some in, and I want all of these resources, and then I, I I'm giving you some some choices. Here is one atomic expression. Here is another atomic expression. Pick one of the two, and then you know, and I want all of these. That that's really what the the, the picture is also trying to capture." Intuitively, what is W, Sriram? So W is the the window. So in, so in the time within which the job must be scheduled. Yes, within which that particular portion of the job must be scheduled. Okay. So effectively, you know, in, in this example, the the atom says, you know, my bundle is two gigabytes and one core, and I want them in granularities of one, you know, one bundle at a time. And I want you know ten ten bundles per minute. That's really my 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 width, so to speak. Okay. 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 So the the pieces that we you know the few other things that that are in the slide that I won't talk about in the interest of time. But the main things we've added to enacting the plan and so forth is there are sort of two sets of two kinds of changing conditions that happen. One is that there is misprediction where the user. Um, can sort of make decisions in you know incorrect choices in two ways. One is they can either specify they they can uh, over allocate for resources, meaning that they they, they think that the the job will run for four hours, but in reality it finished in one. Now we sort of have three hours of resources that we had originally budgeted for them. The way we deal with this sort of misprediction is the whenever resources are unused, they go back into the free pool. They are then available for other best effort jobs. That's one. In the second case, if the job you know that reserved for four hours but exited in one, the remaining three hours of reservation can sort of be returned to the system, and the, and the returned reservations are now available for newer incoming uh, uh, you know newer incoming production jobs. The other the opposite side that can also happen where somebody under under allocated resources, in which case they need to renegotiate to extend their reservation. Uh, we the, the system supports this one. The other bit, the second kind of problem that we also face is if there are failures where you know rather than packing 100% of the capacity for uh, you know for, for effectively for uh, uh, production jobs, you could plan for say 60% of the capacity is reserved for uh, for production jobs. This gives us some headroom to monitor, replan, and sort of move things around. Question. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's unmuted, so uh, go ahead, Surya. Okay, so let me go to the, the next slide, and then maybe if there are questions, I guess now's a good time. So, in, in summary, you know what we did was uh, we introduced the notion of time. Uh, this was a key idea in, in in the system we built, and what it enables is uh, comp uh, support for completion SLAs and also low latency for best effort jobs. This has been an end-to-end -end system effort, started as a research idea, became a prototype, became a real system, is shipping with Hadoop 2.6. Um, there's a bunch of uh, future efforts in this direction, namely in order for the resource reservation planning to work well, you know, it, we need to know how much resources a given job will need. This will require modeling computations. You know, the, the typical pathway in, 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 these, in these big data systems is that the, there is a lot of reputation in the workload, meaning the same job is run over and over again as new data becomes available, and so you can sort of use a past history to uh, to to sort of to, to come up with the estimates for resources. And you know, when trying to get this get better at this is some form of an ongoing work. 
let me kind of pause here. Any questions on this part of the presentation? Yeah, uh, this is, yes, Go ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Okay, this is Shubhi. So can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, okay, thank you. Very good uh, work. I uh, learned a lot of things. Uh, so I have two questions. The first question is because now actually this is Spark is uh, very popular now. Can we apply the similar logic, uh, similar module on top of Spark? Yeah. The, I mean, this so Rayon is a layer that sits uh, the you know that sits on top of the Yarn resource manager, and it sits mm -hmm. below the applications. So you can effectively use Rayon to reserve resources for Spark jobs, and then submit your mm -hmm. jobs against that reservation. Yeah, yeah, cool. And uh, the second uh, question is because now actually we are introducing the time concept uh, into this Yarn uh, resource manager. So you uh, address the SLA uh, issue, but then another option actually we can uh, build our own uh, application layer. We can build our own logic to do the all to, to handle all the let's say uh, task dependencies, all the SLA, all the similar stuff. So which option? So one option is what you 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 did in Microsoft is very good. Another option is actually build the own application layer logic to handle all of this. So which option do you think is better? So I think you, my, my feeling is that you know, separating the two, whereby right. you get the issues related to SLA handled by the, yeah. by the framework, and yeah. then um, all of the dependencies between, between tasks, effectively all the mechanics of orchestrating your computation done at the application yeah. layer. Yeah, OK, OK. Yeah, I know some company actually is doing is building their own uh, application logic to handle all of this instead of, instead of tied to the uh, resource management in in Hadoop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. So, Suram, uh, do we have time for one more? There's one more question pending. Uh, you want to take that, or do you want to uh, continue? Let's let's take that question, and then I'll go to the next part. If a job starts running, can it either be slowed down or can it be preempted? Um, the answer to both is yes to both. Um, so effectively, if you think of uh, so the piece I did not talk about is one of the things we had done in our group before we worked on Rayon was we added uh, pre, you know preem work conserving preemption to Hadoop, and so this allows you to effectively uh, you know pause if if a job is you know if you need to reclaim resources at any time we we have a way to preempt them and this is also uh, committed to Hadoop 2.1. And the preemption uh, is uh, of a job basically preserves state and so on in a way that is sort of uh, uh, the yes. application completely unaware. Um, yes, I mean effectively the the there's sort of two pathways we do. So the the way the way it is implemented is the resource manager whenever it decides to preempt a job, the resource manager tells the 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 jobs the job manager or the application master saying, here is a heads up of five of of whatever twenty seconds. I, I need the I need these many containers back, and you know, and it also tells them I need these many containers back on these machines optionally, uh, and then the application master can decide, um, you know, it has 20 seconds to respond, and if it doesn't respond, the the RM will simply kill those, uh, will, will will do its thing, which is effectively take those containers back. If the application master decides to play nice, you can basically tell the various tasks that you know they're going to go away. You know, you can ask them to save state so that the application can uh, recover them. And this, no, and this concept of this, uh, this process you're talking about, which is this negotiation going back uh, to the application master saying, "Hey, I'm actually going to preempt you." I'm assuming that is part of the SLA as well, right? Yeah, that is part of the SLA, and that is again, that is also, like I said, this is also checked into her, you know, as part of Hadoop 2.1 and, and and up. Okay, and uh, one more question that's come in. Um, the model you've described looks generic. Why is this? Uh, why are you saying that this is necessarily tied to analytics? Um, okay, the, I, I think the anal so there is nothing particular. I mean, I think your comment is right that we've sort of built it on this analytics platform. The the reason why I say this is very tied to analytics as opposed to say something like an MPI. MPI kind of a model. Those are sort of gang, uh, you know, systems that require gang scheduling. You know, Rayon also handles gang scheduling. I didn't talk about that one, so it's applicable for that one as well. The idea of resource—I think one point I do want to stress is the idea of resource reservation and planning is not new. 
I mean, this has been done, you know, through, ac ac across the board. And what we have done is, you know, paid attention to the specifics of the needs of the analytics workloads to sort of adapt resource reservation to the setting. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay. So let me move to the second part of the presentation. This is also again work in progress, and as before, collaboration with a bunch of bunch of folks. Um, this project is called Mercury, and this is you know work is ongoing, and you know, progress can be tracked at this particular Jira Yarn twenty eight seventy seven. Um, so the again the motivation has is, is you know the, the same message that will go through. Uh, we everybody wants to do more with the you know, more with the same hardware. You know you want to increase throughput, increase workloads increase more jobs and improve utilization. And there's the same setup, you know, workload is a, is a heterogeneous mix of long running production jobs, services and ad hoc or background jobs. So the, again the model, if you look at the way resource allocation is done in, in a system like Yarn, um, it, it is done through a centralized system. The centralized system here is a resource manager. The resource manager exposes slots. The, the application master asks the resource managers for containers Whenever the RM gives them the containers, it takes it. The, the AM then turns around, hands it to the node manager, saying, "Start this task for me, please." Now, in the way this is implemented and at scale, the whole the system is based on uh, heartbeats and timeouts. I mean, it's an event-driven system. The, the typical allocation latencies on, are on the order of seconds. Somewhere between three to five seconds is not uncommon from the time an AM makes a request to the RM and the container, uh, you know, and and you're getting the the container allocation, and the reason this is also again time out based is uh, you know when if you look at cl clusters where there are on the order of the, the thousand two thousand machines, each machine will heartbeat into the resource manager once every three seconds, and that, and and effectively you know you, you need about one to two rounds of heartbeats before the the and all of these heartbeats are staggered since it takes a couple of rounds of heartbeats before uh, the container gets allocated, the the wait duration is somewhere between the three to five second range. Now this matters because when we went and looked at some of the workloads, a lot of these workloads have uh, short-lived tasks. I mean, what what is shown on this graph is that on the order of uh, uh, you know, I mean, one of our workloads, we see on the order of 60% uh, of the tasks have a runtime, have a task runtime that is below 10 seconds. So if you say that it takes about five seconds to get a container, that means you know, half 50% overhead is spent. In waiting for you know waiting for a resource to be allocated, you know this this is unacceptably high, and the way recognizing this problem, uh, because the centralized scheduler has scalability limitations, uh, there has been a lot of interest in doing distributed scheduling. I mean the distributed scheduling is some you know there have done a couple of papers that have been published on this topic. One is called Sparrow from Berkeley, and the other one is Apollo from uh, folks in uh, you know Microsoft being Cosmos. Um, they, they, where they have implemented uh, scheduling as part of the, the application logic and these systems handle only one application type. So just to give you a flavor of what they do, every job has a job manager and on every machine just like you have the, the node manager, you have a thing called a process node. The process node exposes a queue. Each job manager decides uh, you know, what task to schedule where and it simply submits the task directly to the individual machine. There is no centralized resource allocator. And then whenever a task makes it to the head of the queue, the, the, the PN will execute the task. Obviously, there are issues about how you choose where to queue. You queue in multiple places. You take corrective action so forth. You know, both of them are discussed at length in the Sparrow and the Apollo papers. But the benefit of this model is that uh, it has very low, you know, low latency dispatch because each, each job manager can autonomously decide where to submit a task and submit it straight away. Now, given sort of the, these models, the, the sweet spot that we have, we've targeted with our work are tasks in the second and up. Anything below in the sub-second range, uh, you know, we call, our best handled by something what we call as an executor model. I mean, this is a system where you, know, you, you get a container, you spin up a task inside it, and that simply responds to you know that simply responds to queries. They think like a web server. You know, you you, you put a kind of web server in a container, and it's just a long-lived executor, which just responds to any query, which which responds very quickly to to short uh, to short queries. Okay. So given this is the speech, what we are after, 
our the key insight in doing in behind our work is that all of these computational frameworks, whether it be Yarn or uh, or the Apollo system or Sparrow, they have a single way to do allocate single way of allocating resources. Either with Yarn, everything has to be allocated by Central. If you did uh, if you did Apollo, everything is done by the application master. So the question we try to address here is, what if we made this programmatic? meaning give applications with a knob for tuning their allocations. So if I'm making allocation requests for a long running service, it's, it's okay to take, you know, to, to carefully decide where I want to run this particular service. So it's an infrequent allocation, slow and careful placement with, with the guarantee that when I decide to run it, I will actually run it exactly where I want it is perfectly acceptable. On, on the other hand, if the allocations tend to be highly frequent, then you sort of want to go down the path of we want to make fast allocations and we want to trade off execution guarantees, you know, namely the ability to queue and make the way to the queue uh, is, is, is an alternate path and is certainly acceptable. And in, in our work, we've tried to combine the best of both. Uh, effectively, the centralized scheduler, uh, you know, the system we've built for Mercury, uh, they have, each application master talks to a runtime and it tells the runtime what kind of container it wants. If, if, it, if it's for, you know if it's very infrequent or slow, the, the the runtime knows that it should ask a central scheduler. If it wants something fast, the runtime can remux and ask one of the distributed schedulers. This is the key insight, and the way this is exposed to applications is you know containers with a specific uh, type of semantics. Now, if you use the if you go back and look, you know look at the yarn model that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, each AM makes a uh, application you know makes a resource request. And in the in the language, it specifies I want so many cores, a, a container with so many cores, so much RAM, and then it all. What we did was we extended the language to also include a type. So you can either tell us that you want a container with a with a with a type that's called guaranteed. What this means is that when the when the when the application master gets it, turns it around, and goes to the node manager and says, "Here is a guaranteed container," that container will start straight away, and the container is guaranteed to run to completion. And this is and the, and, and the semantics here are that the, the these kinds of containers are the stock yarn containers, so they are allocated by the loosely speaking the slow centralized scheduler. The other kind of containers is are what we call queuable ones. Uh, these are effectively executed opportunistically. So the idea here is each application master can individually decide where it wants to run them. So it will s submit to one of the distributed schedulers running locally, asking it to give it a queuable container which only gives it the right to queue a task for execution. There's no guarantee of when this will start, no guarantee that this will, this will run to completion, and this is allocated very, very quickly. And in, in, in terms of, so what are the properties of these two? The guaranteed ones are like stock yarn containers, you know, they effectively are ideal for services or production jobs that require guarantees. Now, if, on the other hand, if you sort of uh, want to run opportunistically scavenge otherwise idle resources, and loosely speaking, you know, Tra traff fill the cluster, um, the queuable containers are, are, are ideal. And you know, we had had in building this system for queuable containers, you know, we had to solve a bunch of problems. One was when do we execute these containers so that there's a high chance that they will finish? How can we sneak them through and improve uh, utilization? And the way we implemented this is we uh, took the existing uh, YARN code base, we, we made some modifications. Uh, the 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 Mercury runtime is implemented by this concept of an AM RM proxy, which is a service that runs inside the node manager. So if the AM wants a guaranteed container, it, it talks to the proxy, the proxy then forwards the request to the central resource manager, gives it the container, and then it goes and runs it as before. Now the application master decides it wants one of them queuable containers, it submits a request to the AM RM proxy, the proxy turns around, gives it a gives it the right to, to queue someplace, and the AM goes and submits a request to a queue on a node manager, and whenever the task makes it ahead of the queue, it will, it, it will run. And we impose policies on how many of these queuables are running around in the system, and and then because you have, loosely speaking, a split brain kind of a model where there are two sets of uh, allocations happening, we prioritize the guaranteed ones over the queuable ones. So the net result when we implemented this and when we ran when when we ran jobs which were requesting both the guaranteed and the 
and and as well as guaranteed and queuable and we change the you know and we look at various percentages of these what we find is that we get about a 50% improvement in uh, task throughput compared to stockyard and uh, and then we are motivated by these results we are basically in the process of communicating uh, you know to process of com committing the code base uh, code back to hadoop there's been a lot of interest in the community and uh, you know in the coming months we will uh, will will do this any any questions at this point before I move to the, the last part of the presentation? So, uh, Sridham, uh, awesome talk. I think we are nearing the end. So, uh, I think you you are agreed to stay on for a little bit after, right? Yes. So, let me quickly finish up this two two more slides, and then I'll pretty much be done. Okay. So, the last bit is you know we want to extend uh, to scale the system out, and in here you know again as I said at the beginning, our goal was to scale it to hundred thousand you know. Uh, tens of thousands of machines and what we have done is leveraged the um, mercury architecture to get the system to scale so the idea is to use uh, federation where each uh, and I think this this picture will probably explain explain it better the goal is to sp split the cluster into a bunch of cells each cell runs uh, runs you know runs mercury and there is a front end piece which to which users submit jobs the front end router decides you know where there is capacity and will route jobs to that one and then the each of these cells can individually come and go and there is a, there are, effectively the membership is tracked by a component called the universal rm or the urm um, quick animation so you submit a job the job goes to the the router routes the job to that particular cell you know the the first thing that the rm does is start a, an application master the application master gets containers there's a policy there which tells the, the you know tells the system that this particular job is allowed access only in, only in the blue colored cells hence you know the requests go there the kind of it gets the containers and then it submits those jobs i mean the idea is effectively to have a bunch of these bricks which you know which we call cells which we then glue them together to form sort of a, a large self healing cluster so where we are at the moment is we have a prototype built you know we can run map reduce jobs over this one we're effectively hardening this and making it better and to I guess to put it all together the stack that we're building looks roughly like this at the lowest level is the cluster wide resource management layer you know this has three components there is yarn plus mercury at the lowest to do uh, scheduling of individual jobs federation to create a much larger cluster and rayon to do resource reservation and provide uh, predictable allocation applications get built on top uh, using this uh, this setup and with that I'll let me, just, let me pause here and take questions great uh, so there are quite a few questions folks uh, for those that need to leave thank you very very much for attending um, please do fill out the seminar <coughs> Uh, survey forms uh, that always helps us uh, improve our seminar and tune our offerings, including any suggestions for speakers and topics. Uh, and um, I guess with that, let's uh, you know please submit questions online, uh, and I will begin with the questions that have come in so far. Um, so I guess uh, uh, the first question uh, is, is as follows. Um, the okay. Um, can can the resource manager also deny incoming jobs? For example, in the sudden burst of several best effort jobs, which will bring down the system. So, can can jobs be pulled off the queue and preempted as well? So, there's two things that happen. So, once you submit a job to the resource manager, the resource manager decides when it is, you know, loosely speaking, safe to allow the job into the system. And this it does by deciding when to create the application master. So that that's how you know it, the resource manager does throttling. Now, once a job is admitted in the system, you can easily uh, take, you know pause the job by just not giving it any resources and combined with work conserving preemption. Those are your two knobs. Okay. Um, Second question, you mentioned earlier in one of your slides that um, you have investigated or were planning on investigating integration of profiling as, mm -hmm. uh, as part of your scheduling process. Can you talk a little bit more about that, please? Sure. Uh, so the, the thing that we, what we, what typically happens with at least these production jobs is that it's, a, you know, it's the same job that is run over and over again. A typical example 
is you, when you want to process you know uh, search log clicks and do some aggregations you collect the logs you know I, I, like i said at the example at, at 6 pm you know you you do some processing and and you generate a report the next day the same thing happens at 6 pm you know you collect the logs you run you, you run the same script run the count the same set of clicks and so forth and so because there is a lot of these production jobs are repeatedly run just that the data changes that gives us enough the past history of these jobs gives us a strong estimate of how long the job will take and and so you can use the past history to come up with a with a very nice model of how much resources the job will need and how long you expect it to run and so who does the profiling is that built as part of the layer yeah, so below a, uh, so there are several uh, tools that are available um, so to, with, you know one of the tools that uh, that, that I mean, there are several tools that are available which simply look at the job history logs, and and then they can you know come up with resource uh, estimates. You know, we've been working with some folks from EPFL uh, on building uh, one such tool. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, you mentioned in your talk bin packing. Um, uh, you know that caught uh, the, that caught my attention. Um, both bin packing and scheduling are sort of uh, uh, from a computing perspective, you know, NP complete. So um, uh, I'm assuming that a lot of your uh, scheduling algorithms are heuristic driven. Yes. In that sense, is there a limit to the number of nodes that your scheduling algorithm can take can take into account? Ah. So the norm, so the piece. So what we do is a good question. Uh, what we had done in one of our, in the in the rayon paper was we actually um, uh, you know looked at so typically all of these scheduling algorithms can be characterized as a linear program uh, you know and the solution of the linear program is basically the cluster schedule and you know even characterizing the and 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 the, and the LPs so LP so LP solvers sort of give you very good solutions and what we had uh, interestingly what we had found was that uh, you know greedy heuristics but it's easy to construct greedy heuristics which provide uh, also very good solutions and when we compared the output of the greedy greedy heuristics that we had with the lp solvers they were pretty close and as a result the the the, the packing uh, packing heuristics that we have uh, uh, we have released are all you know are based on uh, greedy heuristics oh, okay that was actually one question that had also come in so Okay, um, I guess the next one is how scalable is this model? Um, you mentioned that yarn at 3,000 nodes was inadequate. Uh, you were attempting to go to 50,000 nodes. Uh, what do you see as the limit for how many nodes uh, the current architecture can handle? So the way we have designed it through federation that that can, uh, you know, the, the, the point about the 3,000 or 4,000 nodes is because a lot of these allocations are driven by heartbeats. You know, you can certainly scale up to 8,000, 10,000, 20,000 nodes uh, with a single, with a, with a single, uh, with a centralized uh, schedule. You know, with a centralized uh, resource manager. The problem is that at higher, uh, as the number of nodes goes up, the the heartbeat processing overheads begin to increase. As a result of which, you have to increase your timeout, which has the, the the downside effect of increasing the scheduling latency. And hence, you know, the 4,000, hence the 4,000 node uh, number. That that's that's frequently bandied around as the limit for the yarns uh, resource manager, and the way we've gotten around that problem is through federation, where we glue a bunch of these 4,000 nodes uh, clusters to provide sort of a big a, a single system image, if you will. And uh, this one, you know, what we are seeing is we uh, the way the federation system is designed, it can handle on the order of uh, you know 100 100 of these, you know, a few. A small number of uh, a small few t several tens to a few hundreds of these uh, four thousand node sets. I see. Um, is there any production deployment or semi-production deployment of the system? Of the so the yarn plus mercury is deployed. The federation one is work is work in progress. Rayon is also deployed. Um, I think you already addressed this, but uh, uh, in case uh, you have uh, you know further insights you didn't cover, maybe you can talk about this. What workloads are unsatisfactory for this model? So um, okay. So the so the kinds of um, um, I mean you, you mentioned the bursty workloads, right? The short running workloads are not really tuned for this, right? Right. So the burst. So the thing with bursty workloads. Uh, so there are sort of two or three uh, ways. You know, the steps have been taken to address every single one. I mean, like more than 
if you look at jobs which have a small number of tasks are short lived you know they should not be run as individual jobs in this traditional yarn style you know yarn style model you submit a job uh, it spins up an application master which grabs containers and then you put something in there those the overheads there are too high and those are best handled by sort of the executor style model that I talked about. You know, loosely speaking, you have some long running service and then you just submit queries to that particular service and that service manages its own uh, resources. That's the, that's the one that, uh, that that's frequently pointed to as a case that's not particularly well handled. The other bit with YARN has been that uh, anything that has to play in a YARN cluster has to speak the YARN protocols, otherwise it sort of becomes uh, black matter as dark matter as far as uh, YARN is concerned. And so they have taken steps to making uh, long running services uh, be easily runnable with YARN. Um, and th you know, this is not uh, this is work being done under a project called Slider, which tries to get allow you to run arbitrary applications on top of a YARN cluster. Okay. Um I think someone had a comment earlier about uh, you know your model being generic uh, as opposed to necessarily tuned to analytics, and I had uh, sort of a comment slash question on that, uh, if I might. Um, so it, it, to me, it seems, you know, and, and this relates to sort of your um, you know um, your uh, frequently uh, frequently scheduled versus infrequent mo model, the queuing models that the. the mm -hmm two things you talked about. Uh, it would seem to me that by and large analytics workloads fall into sort of the more deliberate slow scheduling uh, model, right? I mean, um, uh, th that you probably don't have a lot of short running bursty jobs for, um, uh, for uh, in, in analytics workloads, or am I wrong? I mean, the, the, the nature of the computation kind of varies. Uh, for you know, for many of the jobs where they want to do large scale aggregations and so forth, those jobs tend to be batch and they're inherently long running. The other extreme is uh, uh, cases where uh, you know folks are interested in generating point reports, and those uh, workloads tend to be bursty and tend to be small. I think the key uh, difference with analytics jobs versus any other other kinds of jobs is that. Analytics workloads are typically elastic, meaning they are willing to soak up as much computation as resources as you give them. There is some degree of parallelism; they are willing to, you know, elastically go up and down. Whereas, you know, the traditional models tend to be more of a BSP or an MPI model, where all the tasks have to come up. You know, they all communicate, compute, and then they all exit. And all of those MPI-style jobs, they, 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 those schedulers typically are responsible for running, you know, ten, maybe hundred jobs in a day. Whereas these analytic workloads tend to run in the uh, tens of thousands, to, uh, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands to millions, depending on the cluster operator. So I guess the one last uh, question that has come in, is there any citation? Uh, have you guys, uh, I mean, I think you said you talked about this in SOCC 14. Um, mm -hmm. Is the citation that is there in your slides that we might want to follow up on? Sure, sure. All of the, whatever uh, citations are put down in the, in the slides, separators, if you will, are okay. the are the ones that you can follow up on? Okay, so folks, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess uh, you know any more questions? I know we are already ten minutes over. Uh, if there's any more, please send them right now. Otherwise, I'll give you guys about thirty seconds. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up here. Um, so, uh, Sriram, while we are waiting to wrap up uh, in the event that there are no more questions, thank you uh, so much for an outstanding presentation. Really appreciate. Uh, uh, your time. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, super busy at Microsoft. Uh, and um, you know, folks will either follow up directly with you or folks who need to connect with Sriram, please uh, send me a note and I can uh, hook you guys up. And uh, I guess if there are no further um, questions, yeah, there are no further questions. So what we what we do, uh, Sriram, is uh, we extend uh, uh, since all of us are from different parts of the U.S. In fact, even overseas today, uh, please uh, we extend you a warm virtual clap. That's what we do here on these webinars. So, folks, uh, I'm going to unmute everyone, uh, or if you are muted, please unmute yourself right now, and let's extend uh, uh, you know Sriram a warm uh, you know round of applause here for an excellent talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was, 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 was fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ram. Thanks. And uh, folks, uh, please do fill out your seminar survey um, at the end of this uh, talk. Our next webinar is going to be actually on May 22nd. Uh, we're going to be skipping uh, April for scheduling reasons. So 
please check the schedule on uh, on the website. As we, as discussed, uh, the slides and the recording should be up on YouTube uh, shortly, uh, pending uh, you know any encoding issues like I had last time. So hopefully it should be up sometime. Hopefully today. Thank you so much, Viram. It's a wrap, and talk to you guys next uh, in in the month of May. Thank you. Okay. Bye.